All right. Mm. Mm. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout the world, every second that goes by, we are working our way, unfortunately, to a global society that has forgotten that Ja Rule was, in fact, a thing. You want to know what? That was probably a good thing. Children of all ages, welcome to yet another edition of the Justin Robert Young live stream, Jury for short. We took a little bit of a break. We are back with a bit of a different format as well. We're going to try and uh, get this thing humming because uh, I really love doing it, but I want it to be better. I'm working. You know, Justin Robert Young, but my middle name is really labor. It's a labor of love for you guys. Here's what we're going to talk about today. I had an experience over uh, the the time when I last spoke to you where I went and revisited my favorite book of all time. Uh, One of the few books that I've reread over and over and over again. One of the few books that I read when I was a high school student at South Plantation High School. It really stuck with me. Themes, elements, dialogue has always for some reason been with me and I decided to review it only to find that I really didn't like it anymore. (laughs) Which is why I ask you at the top of our show, which is something that I hope to do uh, as we go forward, is to vote in today's straw poll. It's going to be strawpoll.me slash 18965. That is strawpole.me slash 18965. Have you ever reread your favorite book and been disappointed? We have three options. Yes, no, and what the fuck is a book? The book that I was disappointed by was The Great Gatsby. Oftentimes referred to as the great American novel. The Great Gatsby tells the story of Jay Gatsby, an eccentric millionaire in uh, the fictitious Hampton community known uh, as East Egg. And the complications with our protagonist, Nick Carraway, and his sister, or sorry, cousin rather, cousin once removed, I believe. Now, reading it made me think of a bunch of things, including one project, and I want your guys' opinion on this. But what struck me the most was that I didn't fucking like the book anymore. And I don't know what made me like the book when I did like the book. I I can't wrap my head around it. And I really don't understand why it's the great American novel. Because on some level, you would think, and and just, I'm going to get into spoilers here. But then again, if you're fucking going to get up my ass about spoiling The Great Gatsby, then I'm sorry. In fact, spoilers are going to be something that, for the vast majority of society, is awesome. Because the only people who are reading this book are high school students who don't want to read the fucking book. So I'm going to spoil things. It is oftentimes referred to as the great American novel because Jay Gatsby creates a new life for himself. Unfortunately, he creates a life for himself through crime and bootlegging. So he has a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, but that is by no measure... The driving force of the book. He's in love with Daisy and he wants money so he can eventually marry Daisy. He moves out to Long Island and creepily buys a house across the bay from her. He starts throwing parties, lavish parties, that he hopes will one day attract but one sole guest, Daisy. 
Nick Carraway, who moves in next door, eventually becomes the conduit for him to meet her, and lo, our plot is pushed forward. But Jay Gatsby, if he is to be America, is a real fucking simp. This dude's a sucker. He's an absolute walked all over the fucking magic carpet in Aladdin was better about not being walked on than fucking Jay Gatsby in this goddamn novel, you know, because at least fucking people who were stepping on the goddamn magic carpet had the good sense to sing a few songs. And Daisy, the object of his affection is absolutely vapid. The one thing that stuck with me is that I don't know in what version of me reading this book did I ever think that uh, or sympathize with the fact that Jay Gatsby wanted to be with this bitch. She is, in a very real sense, Kim Kardashian. Now, I don't mean to say that Kim Kardashian is stupid and vapid, but the image for which she portrays and the brand for which she has built herself on is much like Paris Hilton before, and I'm sure there'll be a million people afterward, because we, we look at that archetype, the famous for no reason, super rich archetype, as if it's a new thing, and it ain't. This fucking story takes place in, you know, I think it's like 1919 through 19, uh, you know, the, the, the 20s, maybe like the, the early 30s. And we forget that there was society pages in newspapers. We've always wanted to know what rich people did. We just have a new form to do it now on Twitter and reality shows. But this girl, Daisy, is famous for being famous. There's a joke at the beginning that you know, when she moved away from Chicago that you know, there was wailing and caterwauling in the streets. Everybody knows everyone's reputation. Every little dent in it could be affected, which is something that we see as you know a theme and stuff like Downton Abbey and everything. Uh, but I have no idea what Gatsby sees in her, except in some you know Romeo and Juliet kind of sense that he's just imprinted with love from the very beginning when he he meets her. Uh, and, and is now it's just this singular desire, but you have to wonder for somebody with that much ingenuity for someone with, who, who is supposed to be America, the, the story of America, maybe it's just America is a different place from when it was written to now. But I don't think if America were Jay Gadsby that we fall, that we fucking completely subjugate our morals and start bootlegging so we can fuck this girl. I just don't think so. I don't think that that happens. So with Jay Gatsby kind of unlikable, Nick Carraway is our protagonist for which we see the story through his eyes. Daisy completely vapid. Her husband, Tom, uh, is a fairly uh, virulent racist, which is pretty hilarious. You know, I, I just, I don't know what level except for the idea that throwing a party, throwing a big lavish party and only trying to get one chick there, which I think is a really awesome idea. Uh, I don't know what I saw in it. I really don't. I don't quite grok exactly where I put value in it. So I'm curious. Go ahead and vote in that straw poll. Again, that is strawpoll.me slash one eight nine six five and i'm curious about the movie the reason why i reread the book was because i was uh curious uh you know to refresh myself on the source material with the movie coming out starring leonardo dicaprio and directed by baz Luhrmann. of course their most famous teaming together was romeo and juliet and there really are a lot of parallels uh between those two stories both of which being that we look at them in very romantic terms And yet, I think you just see a lot. I mean, I think it's not an unrelatable story. It's just unrelatable to me and how I think we perceive it. We look at Romeo and Juliet as, oh, teenage love. Oh, the power of love. The fucking Huey Lewis in the news. Power of love. Uh, 
And certainly that's an element. That's an indelible element of Romeo and Juliet. But it's also, to me, a parable on teen suicide and the pressures that uh, parents put on their kids. Likewise, I look at a great Gatsby as, yes, a story of love, but also a story of somebody who, you know, was a ingenious young soldier who decides to completely subjugate his morals for a chance at, you know, a love that just might not have been to be like what he gives up is his soul to be with her. And I guess if you want to look at that as romantic, that's fine. I just, I don't kind of see that as romantic. I see that as, as basically tantamount to suicide. So there we go. That's the great Gatsby. And go ahead and vote in that straw poll. I am very, very, very uh, curious as to see uh, what you guys, if you guys have had the same exact experience as I did. Iceman48 says, it suffers from time lag like To Kill a Mockingbird, Jerry. Times are so different. That's another one that I really like, but I feel like there are elements of To Kill a Mockingbird, especially with the racial elements that are something that I, I very much believe uh, are still relevant now. I am coming up here on my uh, one year anniversary of living in uh, the state of California, which is mind blowing to me because as it is wont to do, time has absolutely flown by and my life is so dramatically different than it was one year ago today that it's hard to kind of wrap my head around change being that fast and, and life, life as all progress lies to us and says that it is gradual, that we move in an even evolution when that is a bald face fib. It doesn't. All progress in all life moves in fits and starts. It moves in gigantic leaps. One day we can't do something. The other day we can. And it is our continued surprise of that that is kind of a uniquely awesome human trait because we are such pattern recognizers that we can't even recognize the fact that our patterns regularly break with mind-numbing uh, severity. But when I reflect on what is different now in my life about a Cali as a California resident than as a Florida resident and kind of comparing and contrasting both of those states, I came to a sign that absolutely took everything that I think about California. If you were to bring somebody to the Bay Area specifically, but California in general, and you said, I could only show you one iconic element and then send you back on your way, that would give you a sense of what it is like to, in fact, live in California. Some might say, well, show them the Hollywood sign for Southern California. Some might say, show them the Golden Gate Bridge, maybe Alcatraz, something that tourists would come and see. And those certainly are iconic elements of the Golden State, but... They are not a true reflection of what it is like to live here because many people don't commute over the Golden Gate Bridge and most people are not, in fact, in the entertainment industry of Los Angeles. No. If I wanted to have one person know exactly what it is like to live in the state of California, I would show them what I saw today. A sign at my local Oakland farmer's market that informs shoppers that indeed EBT electronic balance transfer or food stamps as they're colloquially known are accepted at the farmer's market. Boom. 
That's all you need to know, ladies and gentlemen. Get on off the plane. Get on a tram. Come on down near to the farmer's market. Happens on Saturdays. Starts about 8 a.m. Goes to about 1. Just take a look at that sign that lets you know that food stamps are accepted at the farmer's market. And that's all you need to know. Now, I'm getting here in the chat room that apparently this is a nationwide thing. That there is not a state. We're looking, I'm looking at uh, New York. It happens in Rochester. Uh, definitely happens in New York, uh, too. That's everywhere now, Jerry. Well, I'll tell you what. Maybe it, it, is, it is true there in pockets. I will say that if it is not a lifestyle everywhere but the farmer's market, then, then, uh, then uh, here, here's what I will say. Your farmer's market is, in fact, a de facto embassy of the Bay Area. If you look at that and think that's weird, then it is an embassy of the kind of element that is pervasive here in the Bay Area and California in general. Because here, it's not weird. It makes sense. You look at that sign, you're like, well, of course. And then you're like, well, what, really? Because I go to the farmer's market because I like the food, but I can also afford to go to the farmer's market. And also I understand that everything you fucking buy at the farmer's market will be gone in 72 hours. It just does not last. There is no fucking shelf life. I have here a, a thing of strawberries and here a thing of clementines that I will have to personally eat. I'm the only person who's in the apartment until late, late, late tomorrow night. And I will have to fucking eat all this goddamn fruit because in 72 hours, it's all dead. It's all a moldy piece of shit. We have, I have just two fucking heaping baskets of moldy shit because food from the farmer's market, if you not cook it or eat all of it in 42 hours, I'm going to keep going down with how long these things last because literally the time is ticking as I talk about it. Beats for your mind says, do you have a refrigerator? I indeed do. That does nothing to slow down the decay of these, this fruit and produce. I, I don't know what it is. It is like it is cursed by a gypsy. Like at some point, a gypsy came up to all these fucking farmer's carts and just like, nah, it will all go rotten. And at some point, you got to say, well, Gypsy, why do you fucking hang around the farmer's market? I don't know. I'm very bored. Why are you bored? Why don't you go hang out with other Gypsies? I am the last of my kind. I used to travel around on a wooden wagon. And now I'm just kind of uh, hanging out. Well, what happened to all your friends? Well, there is a wooden uh, wagon accident. He hesitated there. Why do, you, why do you think? I mean, are you lying? Yes, I am. Are you really a gypsy? No, uh, I'm not. But I do spray poison on all of the fruit. Well, then you're just a criminal. I guess. LOL. And so there we go. <laughs> That's my explanation of all of California and gypsies. Uh... Iceman 48. Weird. Maybe why we were hunter-gatherers for a thousand years before refrigeration. It's a very, very good point. Uh, I also just, I mean, I, you go to fucking Safeway, you buy the same goddamn clementines for some reason that last for 10 years. You can put them on a fucking ship to Mars. By the way, a friend of mine told me that she's got a friend that is right now, as we speak, in Hawaii doing a Mars test. That Basically, it's, they're in a biodome. And they have to live as if they are on a ship too and then landed on a Martian settlement in terms of, I guess, dietary primarily, but also kind of uh, like a politics thing. Like it's like a Martian focused real world. And I kind of feel like, you know, that would be that would be the way to go, man, in terms of a reality show. Because we look at like reality shows now and it's like, I mean, I guess that's what Tom and... Len's comic book, Ten State, is about is about a reality show in a biodome. But I kind of feel like that's what I want to see. I want to see people like really have to lose their shit in, in a biodome. That probably says more about me than it does about anybody else. 
This is going to be the point in the podcast in which we go through the mail. You can mail me at justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. The shorter, the better. The last time that we talked, we talked about sports. And so I will read emails that were sent to me about sports. The first one comes from Natalie. She says people will immediately belittle the thing that they don't like, whether it is football, pro wrestling, comic books, or high fashion. As a big fan of all those things, I always hear, why do you like that? It's stupid, fake, childish, frivolous. If we use quote-unquote advancement of society as a measure of value, then precious little will be left to enjoy. Does music advance society? Do books advance society? Books that cover scientific areas of study or anything written by Andrew Main will benefit society, but what about my favorite Plum Scott Sykes book? Probably not. Whether it's yelling in the stands for my alma mater, Boomer, or getting involved in tedious discussions on the differences between MCU Tony Stark versus comic book Tony Stark, being passionate about something is okay. It would be very boring if everybody liked or didn't like the same things, a.k.a. Stormy Sooner. Uh, she also adds that she hasn't forgotten what my Miami mouse family did to her precious Oklahoma city thunder. Uh, neither have I, and I hope to, to never forget that. This one is super long. It is by Oliver. No frack in the chat room. Uh, he writes jury loving the podcast. Wanted to echo the, uh, on some of the points you made and cram them into a, my libertarian conservative framework. Yes, you have at least one conservative fan. I'm going to read the whole thing, but I will read the first paragraph. People pay for sports. That means by definition, there's nothing available they'd rather spend those dollars on. Watching sports, buying sports stuff, doing things around sports. People do these things because it gives them more joy than anything else they can think of with the same resources. If you want people not to do that, you can necessarily want them to be less joyful en masse and for the world to ultimately be a less joyful place, which would make you kind of terrible. And our final email is from Ken. He writes, to a guy who grew up with no hand-eye coordination to speak of, and douchebag PE teachers and friends who would rather stick a fork in their eye than have you on their team, sports are the worst thing ever. I enjoyed skateboarding, no team or PE teachers, and I can watch the X Games with enjoyment and appreciation for their physical accomplishments. Show me a basketball court and I will run to my happy rocking corner with post-traumatic stress. You should interview Scott Johnson about growing up LDS, but you might want to take a break from religion. Father Robert was fascinating, though. Thanks, Ken. Of course, you can email me, justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. Just go ahead and put J-U-R-Y in the subject, and I will read, hopefully, a couple of them on each episode here on the podcast. And also, if there is anything that uh, you guys would like to refer to about this particular show, you can go ahead and Twitter me, at Justin R. Young. I do want to bring something up uh, that... Our last emailer, Ken, did mention, I really enjoyed doing the interview with Father Robert Balliser about the Pope. I would like to do more singular interview subjects. So what I am asking you guys to email, actually no, Twitter me, at Justin R. Young. Who would you like to see me interview in the same way that I interviewed Father Robert? Now, I have a couple theories on this. Number one, I don't want to do the interviews live for this reason. I want to create a situation where the people that I'm talking to are free to say anything and I have the option to tell them that it will be edited out. I think that will get a different kind of interview than what we have otherwise gotten on stuff like NSFW. Um, so let me know at Justin R. Young. Who would you like to see me interview? Because uh, I really kind of want to do more of those. Otherwise, everything, Justin Robert Young at gmail.com. Remember, put J-U-R-Y in the subject line. And thank you to everybody who emailed. I have big news, ladies and germs. If you were a fan of the Billboard charting comedy album by me and Brian Brushwood, Night Attack, 
you know that 420, April 20th, one week from today, many known, many people know it as Hitler's birthday. Many people know it as the anniversary of Columbine, but less morbid or Naziistic people know it as Stoner Thanksgiving. It will also now become the day that we released our brand new Night Attack album. And I will tell you this, I've listened to the album. I'm very proud of it. It's better than Night Attack 1. It's tighter than Night Attack 1. It's longer than Night Attack 1. Uh, It's got dance remix tracks by Nesh Complex, unlike Night Attack 1. Uh, It's going to be accompanied by not only the puppetry of Jackie Hearn for at least the tracks PSA and Animal Fairy. But really, it's just a a tighter album in in terms of of me and Brian going back and forth. And it's, I'm really excited to see what you guys think about it. Now, along with the album, because if we're going to do something with Diamond Club, if we are going to do something with Chat Realm, part of what is fun about us hanging out together is that we don't just put things out. We like to blow up the Death Star. We like to go and have an impact on the society that is around us. So, when Night Attack 2 is released, with the subtitle, Enjoy the Garden. And you have to say it like that, by the way. It is Night Attack 2, Enjoy the Garden. You have to move your right hand. For anybody not watching this, if you're listening to the podcast version, I'm lifting my hand as if I were to do the like uh, spectacles, testicles, wallet, and watch. Uh, But instead, I'm just lifting it up from like my belt to my nose and then moving it to the right. If it is my right hand, I'm moving it to the right as you lower your voice and say, enjoy the garden. If you would like to, you could be a part of us storming the charts. Now, there's going to be more information on exactly which charts we are storming next Saturday. But I can exclusively reveal to you here that leading up to the Saturday release, I don't know whether it's going to be starting tomorrow or Monday, me and Brian will at least for an hour go live BB live show style. So Monday will be a BB live show kind of thing. Tuesday we'll do NSFW proper Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're going live every single day. We're also going to be releasing a track that did not make the album every single day. Hopefully in the morning we'll release it. So people who are on the email list, which you can get to by going to NSFW show.com slash album get your name your email list or your email on the email list you'll be getting deleted tracks including i think the majority of these are from a session that i did with brian not but a week ago wherein we got pretty drunk and then decided to start recording none of those tracks made the album and we didn't expect them to, to be perfectly honest, but they will mostly all be released over the next week. Uh, Tom Z says, Brian played about 10 minutes of the stuff on NSFW or after NSFW. Yeah. So a lot of that will go out to you guys. So you will have it forever. You'll be able to download it on an MP3 and then have a, a good old time with it. And the, and a lot of it is, If you heard any of the Captain Morgan uh, stuff, a lot of it is at some point I just decided to, we were drinking Captain Morgan rum and I just put the bottle up to my face and started making a voice. Ah, Brian, it's me, Captain Morgan. I have something to tell you. And he sounded really drunk because he was. Uh, So that will all go out. Here's what you need to do. 
go ahead and get on the email list. Also, we are going to do a big fat Reddit push on the day of the release, probably with Jackie's retooled uh, PSA puppet thing. So I want, if you are not on Reddit, now's the time to hit up uh, reddit.com slash our diamond club. Listen, here's the thing. Rabbit Badger in the chat room says, oh, it means I need to have to be on Reddit. Don't think about you to be on Reddit. You got to be on our subreddit. That's it. It's a safe place. We're all, we're, we run it. We run this shit, son. Uh, so come on over to our Diamond Club. I believe it's where we're going to, uh, we'll, we'll try to push it there or somewhere else. But a lot of the planning is going to go on in, in there. So go ahead and go on over to our Diamond Club. Get your name on the email list. And we're going to push this motherfucker to the moon. I don't know what else to say about it. Other than it's, I'm really proud of it. It's really, really funny. There's a 20 minute track called Herbert Hoover. That's really funny. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you what, you want to know what I will read for you guys the track list. Uh, here is the track list, the working track list for night attack two. Track one, go. Track two, Hobo Joe. Track three, The Jaunty Jerk. Track four, Special Massage. Track five, Gay or Not Gay. Track six, Night Soil. Track seven, Dracula Turkey. Track eight, Most Terrified. Track nine, PSA. Track 10, Jerk and Jerry, The Puke and Panhandler. Track 11, Blackout Drunk the App. Track 12, Animal Fairy. Track 13, Time Machine Racist, the movie. Track 14, Racist Justin. Track 15, Justin Robert Young, dot, 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 hero. Track 16, Herbert Hoover slash pot cliche ghost. 17, City Killer. 19, Abe's Labes. Uh, And then there's one of them in there. I don't know where it's going to go but a track called fuckable monsters. And then we have dance remixes for Abe's labes, animal fairy, hobo, Joe racist time machine and superhero. Now this was recorded over primarily three sessions, one close to two years ago or closer to the time that night attack came out. Uh, one of them here in Oakland and another one more recently in, in Austin. So some of it like jaunty jerk Leon one, three, three, seven is saying that that was from a long time ago. It was a go was from a long time ago. Uh, gay or not gay was from a long time ago. But the problem is a lot of the stuff from, from that first session was just all like, jerk off and like dick centric. So we recorded some racist stuff and some drunk stuff. And so now it's <laughs> dick centric, racism centric and drunk centric. So there we go. We evened it out. We cover all subjects. Jackie Hearn has the album. She's uh, if you want to know how it is, uh, you know, she can, you, she can go ahead and tell you. Uh, but I'm very, very excited. So again, I remind you, ladies and gentlemen of Diamond Club, chat realm, lend me your ears. Go ahead to nsfwshow.com slash album. Get your name on the email list if it is not already. And sign up for our subreddit, reddit.com slash our diamond club. And we will take the charts. We'll let you guys know. But I think I think we can make a big splash. Here's the reason why I think we can make a big splash. I was completely recalibrated. My throw my hat over the wall sense was completely recalibrated by something. And I will tell you what it was and get into all of our Twitter feedback 
right after I play this bumper. One more fun little tidbit. Uh, I can confirm what Scott Sigler is saying right now on Twitter, which is that I'm going to come to his apartment and record the Beam Up on Aisle 7 uh, audio book or audio chapter for the Bones Are White audio book. Uh, that was, of course, the uh, little short story that he wrote uh, with the help of Chat Realm. I'll be doing the audiobook version so y'all can go pick that up. Let me explain to you guys how I completely had my my brain blown open. And to let everybody know that I am, in fact, an idiot, I would tell anybody who wanted to listen behind the scenes that I didn't think Ali Spagnola was going to make $40,000. I thought she had overshot. I thought she should have asked for twenty. And then been super jacked when she got up to, you know, 27 or 30. And, you know, I, I was, I was skeptical. I was a skeptic. She completely fucking proved me wrong. She went in the last hour. She, uh, in like the last like 15 minutes, man, she got to $40,000 and I am so proud of her. She is an inspiration to me. And so when we talk about what we want to do for Night Attack 2, I completely, completely had my my point of view reframed of like what I think is possible. Because now I'm like, you want to know what? Let's actually go for more than what we think of. Let's go for what we think is impossible because I have faith in chat realm. I know chat realm has faith in chat realm and there's no time that we've ever thrown our hat over the wall. No matter how high we think that goal is that chat realm has not come through for us. The diamond club has not come through for us. That absolutely the people that care about the stuff that we do in the community that we've created has not responded in the biggest way possible. But while I'm thinking about that, I was reminded today by Iceman48, who is here with us in the chat room, of a frame of mind that is very different than the one I have now. He sent me a YouTube video from his son, who has a channel that uh, he does some animation on. And uh, his son was, as I would describe, very anxious. He was very, very, very uh, nervous. I would describe his pattern of speech as, as scattered. And what he wanted to know was what his audience thought he should do because he only had 27 followers. Now, I know this feeling. When you start out podcasting, YouTubing, blogging, shouting out into the ether is the feeling that you are going to be most familiar with. Because nobody gives a fuck about you. Nobody cares. So what do you do? Because the point, especially in this interactive culture, is interactivity. When there is no one to interact with, do you take that as nobody cares about me? I should stop doing what I'm doing. I'm wasting my time. I mean, you wouldn't be wrong. When I had those thoughts, you know, it, it certainly wouldn't have been the craziest thing to think. But it is missing the point. Because the point, even in this interactive society, is not about interaction for interaction's sake. It is about bringing people to your passion. It is about having your own campfire and making it the coolest place to be. And then once people are there, and you've already set the ground rules for which this interaction is happening, then you interact on top of that. So this kid is asking everybody what he should do. And he's naming off all these other, you know, really successful YouTube channels 
about, you know, should I do stuff like that? Should I do sketches? And I think that is missing the point. Because the point is, what do you want to do? The point is, what can you do that demonstrates the most passion? And then from there, there is only one golden rule that I would say to anybody who wants to get into online stuff, but specifically, uh, you know, it's very, very, very uh, apparent in YouTube stuff. The internet smells effort. The more effort you put into something, the more polish you put into something, the more you separate yourself from everybody else who's doing the exact same thing. And if you're not bringing an audience to your project, then you got to wow them with effort. And so it made me think about this show. It made me think about this podcast that you were listening to. Because I understand that I can bring X amount of people from NSFW show to listen to this show. But if I really want people to give a fuck, I have to earn their time by effort that I put in. So I want to do better for you guys. I want to have my thoughts be clear before I get on here and talk. I want to have the production be slicker, the audio quality better. And it was because I was inspired by Iceman 48 son. And that is interactivity. That is the internet helping the internet. And I'm very excited that it happened to me today. And I hope that somebody out there is listening to this and makes their stuff better. And everybody can benefit from this community that we've set up and the energy and the, the enthusiasm that we all create. That about wraps it up for me. My name is Justin Robert Young. Uh, again, Justin Robert Young at gmail.com. Send me your emails. Put jury in the subject line. My Twitter is Justin R. Young. And until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, please don't die. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Look at Dr. Bird. Come on up. There we go. Yeah, he didn't poop on me. Look at Dr. Bird. Dr. Bird on the live stream. Hey, motherfucker, it's me, Dr. Bird. Wink. Um, all right, gang. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to put this up here on the internet and then I'm going to go get my hair cut. I love you guys. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye.